Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to another Britney seminar. So nice to see you all here. I'm going to pass over to Lila to do the official introduction. But I should say our next Griffin seminar is on the 19th of April from Julia Crico from Argentina. She'll be talking about heme transport in, uh, mocking my pronunciation. <laughs> She'll be talking about heme transport in uh, trypanosomes. So please come along to that. It'll be great. But now I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Claire, for organizing and thank you, Claire, for coming. So it's a real great, great pleasure to introduce Professor Kerry Deitch, which I'm pretty sure does not require any introduction, but I'll just do it for the pleasantry. So Kirk is at the Cornell Medical uh, School uh, since 2001, mm -hmm. and currently a professor, and among the many other titles, he's the co-chair of um, the Biochemistry, Molecular, and Cell Biology Graduate Program. And um, Kirk did his PhD um, in genetics at the Michigan State University, and he was then a postdoctoral fellow at the NIH in Bethesda in, in the US. Throughout his career, and I'm sure Till today, he's going to tell us uh, he's been studying uh, gene regulation in malaria parasites, including, of course, antigenic variation, and as well as trying to understand this unusual aspect of, of genome plasticity in these parasites. And as I said, I think a lot of you know Kirk already, probably from the very many teaching and training activities he's involved in. Uh, some of you might have uh, been there when he was teaching at the biology of parasitism in Woodshaw. Um, some of you might know him um, from being the director of the Cell Biology and Pathogens course in Ghana. And in the past couple of years, I've been lucky enough that he's co-directing me both with me. Um, and the last thing kind of to highlight that um, Kirk has received um, numerous awards. And the most recent one of many is that in 2024, he got elected the fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology. So, you know, no pressure. This is uh, Kirk. Thanks for coming. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. I was in Glasgow once before, almost 20 years ago, <clears throat> which was a spectacular time. This, I don't think this building was even here then, um, and a lot of you were not here. So I had a great time then, and this has been spectacular. Um, so I know this is a very parasitology-savvy crowd, so I have my standard introduction, but I'll kind of zip along um, and get to the sort of meaty bits that I think are more interesting to discuss. Um, some of you will have heard a little bit of this story at the BSP meeting, but I'm going to talk about a lot of other things too. But don't hesitate to put up your hand if I say something that you think is interesting and you'd like to go over because that would make it more interesting. But before I start, um, this is where I work. That's my lab is right there. This is the East River. Uh, in, so this is Manhattan. I, I point this out because the East River is actually a tidal river. So it's basically the Atlantic Ocean, which means I live at sea level. So the last time I saw these two guys, Mike and, um, and, and Richard, this is how they dressed me up. And they took me to this place. I <laughs> hope you can see this. Uh, so this is not sea level. There's not a lot of air up here, which I felt exquisitely <laughs> as these guys dragged me on a bicycle up to the top of this mountain to watch the Tour de France. Um, here's Mike on the top of the mountain, you see, Team Parasites. Maybe you've seen this photo before. So that was a great time. My, my, family thought this was ridiculous that they dressed me up like this. They thought I was selling ice cream or something. But no, we had a good time. Um, and then yesterday, I got to go into the Highlands. This would be something you're familiar with, but something that's unusual for me um, living in, in the middle of New York City. This is a pretty nice change. So I had a great time. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about malaria. Um, I don't need to tell you about the life cycle. All I do is put this up and, and tell you I'm going to focus on this part, the part where the parasites are growing in your red cells, and this is what makes you sick. So this would be our whole, um, everything that I talk about is here. Uh, you guys, I suspect, are quite familiar with this differentiation step based on a lot of the stuff that Andy does around here. So I won't be talking about that today, but we can relate some of the concepts. If anybody's interested, we can relate to what I will be talking about and how it might be somewhat related to this. But we'll be focusing on this part of the stage. Um, and then initially we'll be talking about how the parasite, when it enters a red cell, how it makes modifications to the red cell and the cell biology of the cell. Um, so this is a cartoon I drew a long time ago, of the simple biology of uh, an infected red cell, a parasite living in a vacuole. Here's the parasite's nucleus and the digestive vacuole. It's moving things in and out of the cell across this, this vacuolar membrane. In particular, it's taking up hemoglobin and digesting the globin part and left behind with the heme. It's also exporting a lot of things and altering the red cell membrane. 
In particular, it's putting these knobs on the surface. Basic concept here is if you look at an uninfected red cell, it looks like you took a soccer ball, I guess you say football, um, and you let half the air out of it. So it becomes biconcave, super flexible, high surface area volume. So when the parasite is living inside of the red cell, it's altering that shape. So it's not as easy for this to squeeze through all your capillaries. And in particular, here's a scanning electron micrograph. This doesn't look like a deflated soccer ball anymore. It's distorted in shape. And then you see these little knobs all over the surface. And the reason this is important for the biology of falciparum malaria is if this goes through your spleen, your spleen will filter it out and destroy it. So the parasite wants to avoid going through your spleen. Okay, And it puts these little knobs on the surface. And these are points of adhesion so that the infected cell can stick to your blood vessel wall. And then it doesn't go through your spleen. Okay. So here's a transmission electron micrograph that shows that here's your parasite. You can see the vacuolar membrane. This is the red cell. Here are those knobs. This is an endothelial cell. So you can see where it's become adhesive and start to get a blood vessel wall. This doesn't go through your spleen then, so that's good for the parasite. Um, that's bad for you. You're the one who has these sticky red cells in your, in your bloodstream. So they're adhering to um, the vasculature throughout the body. It can cause very serious problems if it happens in the placenta or if it happens in your brain, you get this cerebral malaria. And that's one thing that people think about a lot because it kills kids. So you have a kid who has headaches, delirium, tremors, seizures, can go into coma. And a lot of times those kids don't survive. So um, just to show you how that what happens, this is the brain taken from a kid that died of cerebral malaria. It's not stained or fixed. It was just taken and sliced and you take a photo of it. I want to draw your attention up here. You see these small hemorrhages. If you look at those under a microscope, you can see a blood vessel. Each one of these is an infected cell. So you can see that this blood vessel has become occluded with infected red blood cells. And so you're getting not only blockage of circulation and hypoxia that can happen here, but you're also getting a lot of um, inflammation from the interactions between the parasitized cells and the endothelium, which can cause a break in the blood brain barrier and you get these hemorrhages. Okay, so this is this is happening elsewhere in the body as well, but it causes these very severe um, complications in the placenta or in the brain is what we mostly think about. Does this make sense? Okay. Um, so I like to show this slide um, to reinforce what I just told you. This was I had been in New York not for maybe a year, and a clinician came running up to the lab and had this slide. And one that she knew that we had a microscope that had a camera on it. She wanted a photo of it. I said, okay, what the hell's on your slide? And she, she told me the story. Some of you come to New York Hospital. Manhattan is not a hotbed of malaria transmission, as you might imagine. She felt ill, had sort of general discomfort. The doc said, yeah, hey, it looks like you got the flu and sent her home. She came home two days later feeling worse. <clears throat> happened to mention, oh, by the way, I was in West Africa a couple weeks ago. And of course, the doc says, oh, you should have told me that. And she said, well, you should have asked me that. And so <laughs> classic sort of thing. So they took a blood smear and they said, oh, we can see malaria parasites in there. She was around 1% of her red cells had, had parasites. So they admitted her to the hospital, put her on antimalarials. This was the next morning. Each one of these is a ring stage of the parasite. So she had gone from around 1% to about over 30% parasitemic overnight. Now, it's not that the parasites had replicated that much, but you, you don't see the late stage parasites because they're sequestered away, they, they're adherent. The next morning they had reinvaded and these parasites had not yet modified the red cell. So she has this really high parasitemia. They actually transfused her. So they did a blood exchange to get an immediate drop in the parasitemia and then kept her on anti-malarias and she was okay. Um, but this is, it just reinforces this idea that in the peripheral circulation, all you see these immature parasites. Make sense? Okay. So this is a slide I like to show. I get, I get to use in two sets of lectures. This I use when I talk about ethics, research ethics, because this is not ethical by today's standards. What one used to do, if you wanted to study falciparum malaria, which only infects people, you didn't have an animal model. At the time, there was no culture system. You needed a volunteer to infect. And so what you used to do was go to a prison and you would ask for prisoners. And the prisoners, in fairness, would volunteer. But one can argue about what that means when you're in prison. 
right? Um, so they got to be out of the cell block and in the hospital unit, get a little better food, et cetera, and they could be in experimentally infected. So this is a young scientist. He's feeding infected mosquitoes on this prisoner. You'll notice the prisoner's labeled. And um, so this was in California. And in front of a parasitology crowd, I like to point out that that looks just like a young David Ruse who's <laughs> doing the infection, right? Um, this is 1945. David Ruse was not around yet. But um, I like to say that. And, and sometimes people go, oh, yeah, that's right. And then they'll ask David about it, and I crack up. Anyway, so th this is the sort of infections that were done until the 1960s and when the US Supreme Court said you can't do that anymore. So we don't do it. But one of the last experiments done was here. This was done at the CDC in Atlanta. So what you can see is this prisoner was infected and you get these waves of parasitemia over time. So the parasites rise, immune system kicks in, drives down the parasitemia, parasites change, you get a new wave of infection. What I wanna point out here is that the peak of, for instance, this first wave, that's 10 to the fifth parasites per microliter of blood. Okay, So that number becomes significant in a second. So you have a ton of parasites living in these people and, and the immune system is this a healthy individual. You can see this classic patterns of allergenic variation. Okay. And what we now know is that each one of these populations is antigenically distinct and it's linked to that process of cytoadhesion that I talked about before. So here you have an infected cell. It's, it's put these knobs on the surface. It anchors a protein we call plasmodium falciparum erythrocyte membrane protein number one, PFEMP1 on the surface, and this is your adhesive molecule. Because this is outside of the red cell, you'll make antibody against this, okay? So what happens is the parasites will replicate, they're expressing a form of PFEMP1, antibodies respond, drive down this infection, the parasites can switch to a different form of PFEMP1, and then reestablish the infection. So it's classic antigenic variation that we see in lots of organisms. Okay, all right, so <clears throat> in addition to being antigenically distinct, when you change which PFEMP1 is on the surface, you change where cytoadhesion happens. So you can see that particular types of PFEMP1 will bind in the brain, the periphery, the placenta, other organs. So you're linking directly virulence with this antigenic variation process, okay? So now we know that if you take the 14 chromosomes of the genome, you can see where these VAR genes, which each encode a different form of PFEMP1, where, they're local, where they locate in the genome. This is very classic. They're sitting next to the telomeres or they're in these tandem arrays that sit in the middle portions of the chromosome, okay? Um, unlike what you're used to with BSG um, antigenic variation of trypanosomes, when you undergo the switching events here, it's thought to be a purely epigenetic phenomenon. So each one of these genes has its own promoter. You have, in this case, there's 62 genes in the genome. You have 50, well, 61 out of 62 will be silent in a epigenetically silenced state, and one will be transcriptionally active. When you undergo a switching event, you silence the previously active gene and you activate a different gene. Okay, so it's an epigenetic phenomenon. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, is so if we look at classic VSG expression in an African trypanosome compared to what's happening in plasmodium, there's a lot of similarities as you can just abruptly see. But one thing that's distinctly different is important for what I'm going to be talking about is that the thought now, and there are trypanosome folks in the audience who can weigh in on this, is that each one of these waves is, actually has lots of different VSGs being expressed in it. It's much more polymorphic. Trypanosomes are sort of a more clever organism, I guess you could say, in that because their switching is, is linked to recombination, <clears throat> it's thought that they have an endless supply of VSGs. In plasmodium, you have about 60 genes, and that's all you have. And there is recombination. You do make new VAR genes, but you don't do it very fast. So the thought is you can't ultimately run out of genes over time, okay? Unlike um, African trypanosomes. And that also means that you have to be very careful at how you play your cards. So you wouldn't want to have 20 or 30 VAR genes on in this first wave because then you would have used up half the repertoire in that first wave. So how do the parasites regulate this in a, in a very systematic or coordinated way? So that's one of the questions we want to address. This make sense? Okay. Um, okay. So the other thing I should tell you is if you look at the parasite's genome, you take these 14 chromosomes, 
we sequence the genome from one parasite, you'll see this kind of a pattern. We sequence parasites from another village or from another patient, you'll see the same pattern of our genes, but the VAR genes themselves are different, okay? So there is thousands of VAR genes in the naturally circulating population of parasites in the field, okay? And there's recombination that happens between these to generate new VAR genes. It's not linked to switching, but it is. it does happen. So you have a lot of VAR genes out there. Um, but there are differences. Um, so the questions we're going to address are, why do parasites undergo transcriptional switching? And if it isn't random, how do you how do you determine which gene to turn on? And one thing that's important in that respect is let's imagine you're in this first wave of parasites. You have a ton of parasites out there. They're infecting. The immune system responds, drives down the infection. That's started out as 10 to the fifth parasite per microdip. So there's literally trillions of parasites in that patient. This next wave is thought to be pretty homogeneous. So if you have trillions of parasites or billions, or maybe most of them die and you only have millions, how do they all know to switch to the same gene so that you get a reasonably homogeneous second, third, fourth wave? so that you can maintain this for a long period of time. So that's a bit of a mystery, right? Because they're not talking to each other. So how do they do this? Okay, so I told you that you have all these VAR genes in the genome. They're mostly different from parasite isolate to parasite isolate. We can put them into certain flavors. We have these ones here that point out, we call A's, then the, the ones here that point in, we call B's. And then the ones in the tan rays, we typically call Cs. But there's this one here that's really interesting. So I told you the rest of the genome, the VAR genes are recombining all the time and they're different. This gene is universally conserved in every Plasmodium falciparum isolate ever found on the planet. It's always in that position in the genome and it never changes. So it's privileged in some ways. It doesn't undergo recombination. So that seems like it must be a pretty important gene, one would think, if it's that closely conserved, right? So what does that gene do? Well, it turns out it encodes a protein that goes to the cell surface and only binds one receptor, chondroitin sulfate A, and that is on the vasculature only in the placenta. So it's specific to binding in the placenta, okay? That's all it does. And since it's conserved, if you're a woman and you get placental malaria and you make antibodies against it, then you're resistant to, to placental malaria in the future, okay? So it's, it's an interesting gene that way. And then we thought, okay, if that gene's conserved and it's the most conserved gene on the planet in terms of our genes, but it's almost useless because it's, you can't use it to infect half your hosts because they don't get pregnant. And the ones that do get pregnant, it's only useful in that window when they have a fully developed placenta. So why is that gene the most conserved one on the planet? That was a bit of a mystery to us. Then we started thinking about it. Well, all these other genomes from related parasites that infect bonobos, chimps, and gorillas were, were put together. And we realized that not only is this gene we call VAR2CSA, this placental binding gene, not only is it conserved in every falciparum on the planet, it's also in exactly the same position of the genome in these four other parasites that infect um, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas. So it's conserved back before there were even humans on the planet. It actually goes back 9 million years. That VAR gene became fixed in that particular position in the genome and hasn't recombined in 10 million years. Before there were people, that gene existed in that spot. So now we think, okay, it must be doing something really important what is it, right? So I didn't know anything about African evolution or primate evolution. So I thought, okay, you go to your computer and you Google search, right? 10 million years ago, Africa, what happened? A ton of stuff happened. It's like this big deal. I don't know what that's all about. So it turns out that is what is referred to as the late Miocene. And it apparently corresponds with a time when Africa went from being pan rainforest to being a mix of rainforest and savanna. Okay. If you have savanna, then you have dry seasons. If you have dry seasons, then the mosquitoes are gone for a while, right? So we thought, okay, that might be interesting. Suddenly you have seasonal transmission instead of continuous transmission. So one hypothesis was, at this point in time, the parasites needed to be able to maintain that asexual infection longer 
to wait for the mosquitoes to come back if you end up in a dry season, okay? So how might one do that? And um, I think somebody told me Chris Newbold is online. This paper came from Mario Rucker and Chris Newbold in 2011. And they had this really interesting hypothesis for how parasites could coordinate switching events over the length of an infection, okay? So that you wouldn't have random activation of genes over time. And it was a mathematical model that I think two people in the world understood, Mario Rucker and Chris Newbold, and the rest of the world sort of said, well, that's sort of interesting, but I don't know what the hell he means, right? Okay. So in short, one of the aspects of that mathematical model was that you would have, if you imagine bar genes in a network, there would be nodes within that network. What that means is that if your immune system is on you, antibodies are coming, population's falling, and you're gonna undergo a switching event, you don't, you don't undergo a random switching event. Certain genes are preferred, so you have the nodes where you switch into, and then you'd have nodes that you would switch out so that the whole population would have some sort of coordination to their switching properties, okay? So we started thinking, well, maybe this hyper-conserved bar gene might serve something like that. So it would regulate the switching process over time. That would explain why it evolved when it needed to have longer infections because the mosquitoes were gone. You had to be able to extend your infection further. So maybe this gene actually has a second role. One is to bind in the placenta, but the other is, is this transcriptional switching node network. So it was a hypothesis we thought we could test. So this is the guy who decided to take this on, and Joe Bassone, he's a grad student in my lab, he's just about ready to graduate. And so he took on this, this hypothesis. So here's a simple idea. We have our gene number one that's on in your population. Immune system that is now detecting this, antibodies are coming after it. You're gonna have a switching event. It could be stochastic or it could be stimulated in some way. We can talk about that later if you want. But you're gonna go undergo a switching event, all the parasites in the population, because of this node is preferred gene, they'll switch into that node first. But this is transient for some reason. I'll get to why it's transient. So you switch in here, that normalizes the whole population. And then you switch out to this gene, and that becomes the gene that now makes the second wave of parasites. Okay. And if this is in some way biased and not random, you'll you can take a heterogeneous population switch into the node and out and, and sort of normalize your and coordinated switching, okay? So, okay, that's a clever model. Maybe it works. How could we potentially test this? And why would bar 2 csa be capable of being transiently activated in this way, okay? So um, one thing that we wanted to say is if this is going to be, is there any evidence that this gene would be transiently activated in the process of a switching event? And then if so, why? So one thing that Joe did <clears throat> is he did a simple qPCR assay where he looked at var gene expression in a population over time, and var genes are active around the middle of the first half of the cell cycle. So here's the gene that's on in this population. But if you looked really early, right after they um, infected the red cells, you'd detect this gene, var 2 csa this conserved one. You get a bounce in transcription, and then it goes away. And then this other one takes over. So it's transiently active in this so I mean, okay, why is that happening? VAR2 CSA is unique amongst VAR genes. It has a different type of promoter, and then more importantly, it has an upstream open reading frame. So it has an extra element that sits here. This is an, I don't know if you've thought about upstream open reading frames in the past, but they have a very specific function. They regulate translation of the mRNA of the gene that comes down. And I'll show you exactly what we mean by that. Here's our gene. This gene can become transcriptionally active. So the promoter's active. So you make an mRNA. If you're in a pregnant woman, this mRNA then gets translated. You make PFE and P1, you bind in the placenta. But if this gene gets activated in a non-pregnant individual, what happens is your ribosome comes to the calf, scans until it finds a start codon, translates that first open reading frame, hits a stop codon. When it hits a stop codon, it falls off, which means this doesn't get translated. So this PFE and P1 is not made unless there's a placenta around, okay? So, okay, that's interesting. That's what keeps the gene off when there's no placenta around. What does the parasite sense in a placenta that enables them to translate this and know when they're in the placenta? We're working hard on that. 
we don't have a good answer yet. We can talk about that if you want to. But this is interesting. So you could, in theory, activate this transiently. You wouldn't alert the immune system because you don't make any PFMP1. Then you'd switch out. But why would you switch out of this? And my student, because he's smart and he's had biochemistry since I have, he said, that looks like template for nonsense mediated decay. Well, how many of you remember your nonsense mediated decay? But what that means is when you have a premature stop codon, that will destabilize the mRNA and it'll come and be degraded. Okay. Which puts together this kind of a model of our gene number one is on. A switching event is induced. You go to VAR2 CSA, you make an mRNA. If you only translate the upstream open reading frame, nonsense mediated decay degrades that RNA, and then something called nonsense mediated transcriptional gene silencing kicks in to shut this gene off and then kicks you up someplace else. Okay. So that's how this would work as a transient switching node. Okay. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but the nice thing about this hypothesis is it's pretty easy to test. If you knock out nonsense mediated decay, which is single gene, you can knock it out. You would presume that this you wouldn't be able to switch out. You'd get stuck here. Okay. Also, you can make a one base pair mutation in the start code on the upstream open reading frame. Then you wouldn't translate this. The ribosome will go straight to the open reading, the second open reading frame. And again, you should get stuck in the node and not be able to get out. And what you should do is make parasites that are incapable of switching. They get stuck here. Does this make sense? Okay, so we do the experiment, right? Okay, so first, when I show you the experiment, let me show you how we're going to display data. <laughs> what we have is real-time PCR primers to every VAR gene in the genome. So you can take a population, extract the RNA, and do PCR and see which gene is on. And we can show this also as a pie chart. This is the dominant gene, and this is whatever we're detecting from the other genes. Okay? Okay, so we do, we do take a wild-type population of parasites. This reasonably homogeneous for a particular VAR gene that's on. We can then isolate individual parasites, grow up clonal populations, and you can de detect the occasional switching event, okay? So now we do the same process, but in this case, we knock out nonsense mediated decay, okay? First thing that happens, we take this population, we knock out nonsense mediated decay, and the entire population goes to VAR2 CSA. That's what the purple is, okay? Then we make clones of it, and we can't get any clone that isn't on VAR2 CSA. They seem to be frozen in that in the node, okay? So then we do the same experiment again, but this time we make a one base pair mutation in the start codon on the upstream open reading frame. And again, you get them stuck. They can't switch away, okay? So that whatever is happening in that node, parasites are switching into it preferentially, and then they're, they're, they're um, using nonsense mediated decay as a way to get out of this node, okay? So those parasites are otherwise okay? So far, they grow beautifully. So the whole role of nonsense mediated decay. In it's a good question. Scenario. So same time we were doing this, Stuart Roth's lab in uh, Melbourne, um, they also knocked out nonsense mediated decay pathway, and they weren't interested in VAR gene expression. So what they did is just took all the RNA and did a, a, a deep RNA seq read to look and see what else is happening. And what you see is some degree, uh, an increase in retention of introns. So mRNAs that didn't get properly spliced. <clears throat> which normally would be degraded, now persist. But in terms of parasite growth, they were fine. They seem to be okay for the most part. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this induced switching or is this just parasites growing? Yeah. So in this case, these are just parasites growing. You're right. We do, we can talk about that later. We published now that we can induce switching to VAR2 CSA with, by changing some media concentrations, which we can talk about later if you want to. But in this case, we don't induce anything. Basically, we do the transfection here. And I don't know if you've transfected plasmodium, you transfect, you put them on drug pressure, they all go away and then they come back. And it's the transgenic ones that come back. The transgenic ones are already on VAR2CSA and you can't get them to get off it anymore. They're stuck there, okay? Now, what I can tell you is that we can do the same experiment on some parasite lines where the VAR2CSA promoter is not being transcriptionally active and they, you first then have to induce the switch to VAR2CSA, then they're frozen and they can't get out of it. Um, so this is a switching phenomenon. It's when you switch to VAR2 CSA, you get stuck there because you can't get out. We've, we've frozen their ability to get out of the node. Okay? Okay. So just to reinforce the role of nonsense mediated decay, this is the upstream open reading frame. It's 360 base pairs long. 
if you look at the ability to reinitiate translation, if you make the upstream reading frame longer, then you, you prevent parasites from doing a second um, round of translation. So if we put an m neon green here, the parasites are never able to switch to R2 CSA because they can't overcome the, the role of, they can't reinitiate translation. So this gets back to what you were just asking. We can take a wild type population, and if we induce switching to R2 CSA over time, it'll go to R2 CSA. If we use a, if we put the um, MDN green in position in the upstream open reading frame, you can't get it go there because nonsense mediated decay is degrading that message like crazy, and you can't overcome nonsense mediated decay. So now we got parasites. I showed you some parasites that are stuck on VAR2 CSA. Now we've got parasites who cannot go to VAR2 CSA because nonsense mediated decay is hyperactive on those. Okay, and we can change that. We can force parasites to turn on the second open reading frame to undergo this translational switch by putting a drug shuffleable marker here. And then what you see happening is you can grow those parasites, put them under blastocytin selection and get populations here. But if we put, um, and it takes about eight days, but if you put um, MDN green here, they can't do that because nonsense mediated decay is degrading that mRNA all the time. But if you knock out nonsense mediated decay, then they will go there. And then they get stuck there and they can't get back out. And what you have is a bunch of green parasites because they're expressing neon green in this position and they can't switch away from bar 2 and they're frozen there again. Okay. So the model that came out of that is very similar to what Rucker and Newbold pro um, proposed way back in 2011, is that you have bar genes that are on, you have this node that's unstable and you, you get these switching events that will take you to another one. And that homo homogenizes the switching events to get you, you through a full, a longer infection. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, so the other story I'll tell you is a short one where um, we're wondering about this concept. Yes? Just going back to that story, what happens if you knock out VAR2CSA? Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> good question. So if we knock out VAR2CSA, and what the way we do that is, is you might remember var 2 csa is near the end of chromosome 12. So what we do is just truncate the chromosome, it's gone. What we get is we drastically reduce switching frequencies. So it looks like the parasites are either stuck on whatever var gene they were on before var 2 csa existed. So they, they sit like this for a long time, or they get stuck in something I'm about to tell you about, which we call is the many state, which we'll talk about in just a second, which also was derived from that original record and Newbold paper. Um, okay. That actually, the, the knockout of R2CSA is published now. You can look that up if you want. Yeah. Another question. Do they always have to go back to R2CSA before switching to another? Yeah. So it's a good question. I don't have a great answer for you. Um, it's The switching rates go, to, go down really low. And so our parasites become really stable. And trying to convince a graduate student to grow a culture for two years and see if it switches is hard to do. Um, I suspect they can switch without VAR2 CSA. And one, one reason to think that is you might remember that evolutionary tree. Half the Lavarani don't have VAR2 CSA and they can undergo switching as well. So our current hypothesis is that this is an add-on that enables more efficient and more coordinated switching is the idea of through this node network that Record and Newbold um, proposed back in the day. Um, yeah, that's our thought right now. So, yeah. So just regarding the coordination, what's your thought about what is going to switch to once uh, back to CSA is? Uh, yeah, yeah. This part. Because we just talk about coordination. Yeah. So obviously most of the parasites will probably return to the original VAR1 after the brief period of back to CSA expression. That's right. So in the Rector and Newbold paper, their hypothesis was you go to the node and then frequently you go back to where you started, yeah. right? And on occasion, you'd go to the, to, to the node and you'd go away. And then your question is really relevant. It's the last slide of my second half to tell you how this works, is why is this not just, just as random as that? And where does this coordination come from? Okay, anything else? Okay, um, all right. So antigenic variation in African trypanosomes and plasmodium and lots of these organisms is often based on this idea of mutually exclusive expression. So you express one bar gene at a time, you always express one bar gene. So switching is then efficient between these, right? <clears throat> so for instance, in our assay that I showed you before, you could imagine a population expressing this VAR gene, which dominates. 
And then if there's a switching event and then you regrow, you have a different bar gene on and it's homogeneous, but every parasite should express one bar gene, okay? And that gives you this kind of pattern. Um, okay, but what we had noticed, and it's actually in the literature, but nobody ever talked about it, is you can make a population of parasites, isolate a clone, grow it up, and you'll see this kind of pattern, which makes sense. You have a dominant var gene. Maybe you have a switching event or two. But occasionally we get this pattern where you see you have a very heterogeneous pattern and there's really no var gene being very actively transcribed. And we said, well, what's this? And well, we did a lot of hand waving and we really didn't know what it was. And so one thought was, well, maybe each one of these parasites happens to have chosen a different bar gene so you get this really heterogeneous population. Let's just reclone it and see if it goes back to this. And it would be like, okay, it all makes sense. Well, this person, Francesca Florini, who's a postdoc in my lab, she didn't buy that explanation, okay? So she did a series of quite heroic cloning trees where she'll take a parent population, isolate, you get these parasites we call singles. But then you get these ones that look like this, that look like a mini. Right? And actually, in the Rucker and Newbold paper, they described this possibility of a many state where parasites can activate many genes at a low level before they actually choose a gene to be active. Okay, So she would see that, and you can take a single and get manys out of it. You can take a man many and get singles out of it, so it's something they can switch back and forth from. And what you see is that when, when a population is in the many state, the total of our expression level is much lower than it is if it's in the single state when there's gene on. So she said, what's this all about? And I said, I don't know. And she said, well, we're never going to figure this out unless we look at it at the single cell level, what's happening in an individual parasite. Okay, so she takes, she makes new clonal populations, two of them in the many states, so you see very little expression happening, very heterogeneous, and two in the single state, we have a high signal of one individual gene. She says, let's do single cell RNA-seq on these. Okay. She used two methods. One is an old fashioned method, drop seek, that we happen to have a homemade rig in the lab so you could do it. So you, where you isolate individual cells and pull the RNA from the individual cell. And then she tried this new method called a honeycomb. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. <clears throat> it's this little gadget that you can put in your pocket. And it was made by Perkin Elmer, although it's now been spun off. And what's the real advantage of this, it's a gravity fed um, little trough that individual cells fall into. And the advantage of this is it's portable. So in principle, you could go into the field, take a blood sample out of somebody, apply it to this. You can take it, then put it on dry ice, freeze it for up to a year, take it back to your lab and then do the single cell. You thought, okay, we should try this thing. So it turns out it works beautifully. I can tell you more about it if you're interested. It really works nice. Okay, so what she did is she took these populations and she did single cell RNA-seq on both of them. And what she found was this sort of uh, uh, single cell where you have a single VAR gene that's on at a high level. <clears throat> this makes sense. This is what we all talk about in terms of mutually exclusive expression. And then she'd get these kind of parasites where there was essentially no active VAR gene at all. You might occasionally see a transcript coming off of a gene, but not much happening. So this violated our old mutually exclusive expression paradigm. And then she'd see this. We should have an individual cell where the, the dominant VAR gene in the population was on, and then a second one would be transcribed. And we currently think this is probably a parasite that's undergoing switching. And we're seeing, we're catching two open genes at once but we, we can't say that for certain yet. <clears throat> we have whirled out that this is a double infected red cell. I can tell you how we did that. But um, So we see these three states, two of them, which violate our, our mutually exclusive expression paradigm. And if you look at these populations, the single populations are dominated by parasites like this, where these populations are dominated by parasites like this, okay, that aren't expressing any bar gene. And so what does that mean? Well, our first thought was, well, this must be some wacky thing that happens <clears throat> in parasites that you grow in culture for a couple of decades and they're all they're just mutants and it doesn't mean anything, right? So we tried it with multiple lines that we had in the lab and we always get the same pattern, so, okay? So we took all these populations, all these parasites, we put them together and did a, a garden variety U map analysis. You imagine you've seen this sort of thing where you get individual cells plotted out. And this is what the lab refers to as the gorilla prop plot. I don't know, can you guys see the gorilla? Yeah, once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? It's there, right? Okay, so we said, okay, what's different about the parasites in the different states? Well, it turns out the, 
what's driving this arrangement is bar gene expression. So the butt of the gorilla is one bar gene. And then you see the head of the gorilla is a different one. There's a knee of the gorilla is that bar gene. The foot is this other, that's bar 2CSA. So if you remove bar genes and Riffins and Stevors, what you see is that you lose the whole gorilla. The structure goes away. So the, par the individual parasites in, the, in terms of their transcriptome is virtually identical with the exception of which bar gene is on. And it's in the middle of the gorilla here are these nulls or minis, the parasites that aren't expressing a bar gene at a high level, okay? So does this mean anything biological? So is there any significance to this? Is this just some sort of wacky um, culture phenomenon? Well, the reason we got interested in this is that there's this, you can go check out this paper. There's this phenomenon that has been known for a long time, but not explained. So you can have an individual who grew up in a malaria endemic region, has been infected a bunch of times, developed some level of immunity so they don't get sick anymore, move to Europe or they move to the States, live there for a decade, donate blood for a transfusion and the recipient gets malaria, okay? Or they get pregnant for the first time and they get placental malaria, or they have their spleen removed so there's no longer a, say, adhesive pressure and they get really bad parasites, okay? We said, well, that's interesting because these parasites should have run out of our genes by then. And maybe that's why they're not getting sick anymore. Then the second um, observation was from Anna Bachman. One of these individuals came from <clears throat> West Africa, went to Germany, didn't have malaria. They even tested for malaria, had her spleen removed, got really sick, lots of parasites in the circulation. They looked at VAR gene expression and those parasites were essentially these VAR nulls. They don't express any PFMT1 at all. So the thought is that you shut down the whole VAR gene family, become invisible to the immune system. You can persist then, although you're not a very fit parasite because you're not cytohesive. And only when the removal of the spleen comes along do those parasites um, get much larger and, and the population grows up. So the idea you can have these persistent infections if parasites go into this null state for VAR gene expression. Yeah. Can, can these parasites be hiding? Exactly. So the question is, where do those parasites go out? Because I told you if you get filtered out by the spleen, that that's why you need to side with here, right? Now you're not side with hearing where you're going and how are these parasites sitting around the longest one of these with a 13 year infection, where they're completely asymptomatic, okay? So we were thinking, well, where would they hide? <clears throat> one thought was in the bone marrow where the gametocytes go and gametocytes don't make PFNP1. So maybe they're just sitting in the, in, in the bone marrow. That was our first idea. Then there was this group from recently in uh, the Australian researchers working in Indonesia. And they were hanging out in the hospital in the trauma ward. And they had individuals coming in who um, had had, uh, who tested negative for malaria, adults. They had their spleens removed <clears throat> um, due to trauma. And these researchers got their hands on the spleens, opened them up, and there's lots of parasites replicating inside the, in the lumen of the spleen, not the filtration part of the spleen, in the center of the spleen, completing the life cycle and replicating in there. You think, okay. I learned that you have to avoid the spleen. And now we're seeing that there are parasites replicating in the spleen, right? So I thought, well, that seems odd. So I, I decided, what do I know about spleens? Nothing, right? So you go, you do a Google search. What's the story about spleens, right? So it turns out this really fascinating um, story about spleen biology that is best described in seals and in racehorses, okay? Why seals? But it turns out seals dive really deep in the ocean, right? So they're, they, they have to hold their breath for a long time. So they have this really high hematocrit. But pumping when you're laying on the beach, you don't want to be pumping all this high hematocrit all the time. So apparently, I'm told, a seal will take fully 50% of its red cells and store them in a non-circulating pool in the middle of their spleen. And when they dive, they contract their spleen, push all those red cells out into the circulation. They can carry more oxygen. Then they come up and then they open up the spleen and they contract. Now, apparently, people will, can do the same thing to a much lower degree, okay? And there's a National Geographic article, so popular press, about divers, skin divers in the Pacific that have extra large spleens. Okay. So there is a non-circulating pool of red cells that sit in our spleens for some amount of time. So you can imagine a model where these <clears throat> bar null parasites can go and, and sit in a non-circulating pool of red cells in your spleen or elsewhere, but there's some evidence that 
that you can find parasites in the spleen, where they could sit there and hide and not be in the circulation. That remains to be proven, but it's the the only serious data that we have that, that would address this. Yeah. What uh, wouldn't this parasite do effectively to an killing power in the So yes, they would be very non-virulent. That's absolutely right. And these people that we're referring to, these sort of asymptomatic adults, um, they have no symptoms. They seem fine. The really interesting question about this, I think, is it, let's imagine this model holds. I've made immunity to all these bar gene products. I have this population of non-circulating, non-virulent parasites in my spleen. Who cares? Unless I can transmit. Because if I can transmit, then I, I'm going to get kids sick and I'm going to be the typhoid Mary that's spreading this. Now, Antoine Clayson's, who does a lot of work on this stuff, he was recently, he gave a webinar recently that I listened to, and he was in, I think he was in the camera room. He checked two villages and looked at the asymptomatic adults. How often, if I use really sensitive PCR, do I find parasites in these people? And the number was shocking. It was like 85 and 90%, depending on the village, where adults, completely asymptomatic, had detectable parasite DNA in them. So that... If you're thinking about doing an eradication campaign and eliminating parasites from a village, you're no longer just talking about treating all of the, the people who have um, active infections, you're talking about treating everybody else, right? Sorry, Chris has a question, uh, Chris Newbold. Of course. Uh, if you unmute yourself, yeah, go for it. Oh, hi, hi, Kirk. Um, I've just struck me that um, if that um, explanation about the spleen is right, if you, um, if you took your, average um apparently asymptom a a parasitemic individual in africa and subjected them to mild hypoxia you might <laughs> see some parasites i had i was sitting with freddie frischnick had um in australia at the meeting and i said you know what we should do because if you go online you can find a study where they did exactly this they put um an ultrasound on people so you can visualize the spleen then they put them in a mask and made them hypoxic to watch and see if the spleen contracted. And it does. And I thought, hey, Freddie, we should go into the field and do this <clears throat> and see if we can take an aparasitemic person and have their spleens contract and see if it'll shove the parasites into the circulation where we could detect them. I think it's a spectacular idea. Um, I don't know if there's going to be an IRB issue with that or not. I have to think deeper about it. But I think it's a great idea. We could test the hypothesis that way. It, it would be much less invasive than what the Australians are, are doing is actually getting the spleen out of people, right? You have to wait for somebody to get in a car accident before you get the spleen. This would be easier. Um, along these lines, I will show you one more piece of data is um, we use these antibodies. This is from um, Terry Taylor in the early 1990s. They went and took blood from 834 hyperimmune adults. So these are people who have a ton of antibodies against different forms of PFP and PD1. They pooled all those antibodies purified the IgG fraction, and then they found that that pooled IgG fraction recognized all 22 field isolates, so it has a ton of antibody in it. If we look at our parasites, here you have uninfected red cells. This is our normal parasites that are expressing a bar gene, so you can see they shift. They're recognized by the antibodies. Our, these, these many state or these null parasites basically don't show any recognition by the antibodies, so they're actually not putting any PFE and people on the surface. Um, Okay, and then one last thing I can say is um, what we found before is that we could take a population of parasites and overexpress SAM synthase. So SAM synthase makes SAM, which is your methyl donor, which does histone methylation. So if you overexpress SAMs, all our population will go to bar 2 csa So we thought, well, what happens if we knock down SAM synthase? So we do that experiment. First thing that happens when you knock down SAM synthase is total VAR message goes way up. And then if we look at the population, you see that there are six or eight or 10 VAR genes that are really highly active in these populations. And interestingly, this gets back to your question, is that this is not a random set of VAR genes that get activated when you knock down SAM. It's a very specific set. If you look at the single cell level, it's the same pattern. So every individual cell has lost mutually exclusive expression, and they're all expressing six or eight genes at once. And it's the same six or eight genes. We take a different population of parasites. We've done it four times now. Different populations. We start out, you get a different pattern. But it's the same pattern in every cell, implying 
these genes have some preference. And when we knock down SAM, they're the genes that get activated repeatedly in that population, implying that they're somehow marked or in a better position to be active, which gets back to the switching node model that when you switch out of the node somewhere, there's it's not random. There's something preferential about it. And we think we may be detecting that here. I don't know what's different about these genes. It's probably epigenetic, but we don't know with the marks we've looked at, which are the marks we have antibodies against, we don't see anything inherently different here. So that's another thing we're after. Yes? Do you know if this has anything to do with the uh, nuclear 3D structure? So that's a great, so there's this model in trypanosomes is where it came from, but it's also been applied in plasmodium, that within your nucleus, there's this, a place where bar genes go to get activated. And you, bar genes move in and out as they become active. That was employed once as a model for mutually exclusive expression, that that site would only accommodate one gene at a time. Well, clearly it can accommodate more than one if we manipulate the cells. We haven't looked at these yet to find out if all those bar genes are going into one place to become active, or we now have more than one active site. We don't know. It's a, it's a really good question. Okay, I think that's my last slide. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say that this gets back to Rector and Newbold's model. Um, okay, so just to tell you, this is our group in New York, Larry group. All the work I told you about today was from Francesca and Joe. The stuff on mutually exclusive expression, you can read, it's on BioArchive if you wanna see all those data. The stuff about nonsense mediated decay is done by this guy and it's his thesis and he needs to write it. So <laughs> if anybody's interested in sending a quick note, oh, I heard, heard you really should write this out, that'd be great. Okay, so thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was great. So if you're online, if you raise your hand, I will allow you to talk. Um, Francis, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it out? I see that. I thought I allowed him to talk. Uh, okay, any questions in the room? Richard. What's been done to look at the product of the micro reading frame? Ah, that's a really good question. So the upstream open reading frame encodes a protein. When we first saw that, and we knew we were thinking about translational regulation for nonsense media decay or for translational repression, it doesn't matter what that encodes, it could encode anything. In fact, we changed the amino acid sequence of it. But I don't, I think your question is spot on because if we go back 10 million years of evolution, the amino acid sequence of that protein that's encoded by the UORF is absolutely conserved. So I'm convinced it's important. <clears throat> We've been trying to figure out what it does. We know it goes into the ER. Um, Ron Zakowski, a former postdoc of mine, who's also been working on that, he says, well, if you really loosen up your blast um, searches, it looks a little bit like these receptors that are involved in ER phagy. So when you're, you're under ER stress, your ER gets too big. There are little receptors that go through, interact with ATG8, I think it is, nibble it back in order to maintain your ER in a particular um, way. So one thought, and this is this coincides with this idea of translational regulation, which open reading frame are you going to translate? Oftentimes that's regulated by things like EIF2 alpha phosphorylation, which is a stress response. So you could imagine something about being in the placenta is inducing a stress-like response, which would involve this upstream open reading frame being an ER, and that might be how all of this regulated. So that's as close as we can get on that. Um Francis, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Okay, so thanks, Kek, um, for the wonderful talk. So I just wanted to find out, firstly, in high malaria transmission areas where um, there is high complexity of infection, do multiple um, infecting parasites express the same virgin to limit the um, the the um, antigenic repertoire? And secondly, considering and the model for, for um, Varnog parasites, I just wanted to um, link it with in the long dry season, particularly in uh, then we really don't see malaria. So could we um, 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 let's see hypothesize that, or could it be linked to any? Um, metabolic um, sensing. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, 
So the first question was, what if you are infected by two different parasites with different genotypes? So they, in principle, have different viral repertoires, although they share VAR2CSA. So our, we imagine what you'd have is two overlapping waves and troughs from two separate infections. Because in principle, what you ask is, is, do the two different genotypes coordinate so that they're activating the same VAR gene at the same time? Well, they don't have the same VAR gene, so they probably can't because the repertoire is different with the exception of our two CSA. So then your question was, well, what happens at the end of a dry season? So there's no mosquitoes around for six months, let's imagine. Parasites go into this var null state, maybe. Um, what happens when the mosquitoes come back? Is And one hypothesis out there has been that either the diet of the people changes and the parasites sense that, there's a metabolic change and that tells them to, to make gametocytes and get ready to transmit, or is it purely stochastic? and they just happen to be around. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, we have messed around quite a bit altering our media conditions to see how it affects VAR gene um, expression. The only thing we can get to happen is we can get VAR 2 CSA to switch on, or we can prevent VAR 2 CSA from switching on. And maybe that's linked to switching frequency if VAR 2 CSA is serving this node but we haven't come up with anything that would be consistent with, with the model that you're, you're asking about. So. A, a very naive question, beautiful talk, by the way, thank you. Thank you. Um, about this, about this uh, period during the, the, the dry season, and then you've got this 13 years, so, so, and, and, and your hypothesis is that it, it could be sequestered into the spleen, into a various regions. Is that now going through a regular cycle in there? Is there some sort of hypnozoite like yeah. stage? I mean, I mean, because it's going to be important in eradication, isn't it? Because we really need to know what's happening there. So, so, so how, does your, how does your hypothesis fit with, with what is known out there, what is thought out there, how the concept works? Yeah, so this came up at the, the Australian meeting when the group working in Indonesia was presenting work and then Matt Marty's, who you guys know Matt Marty, they've done a little bit of splenic work. Although it's different, the Australian group was working in adults who are completely immune and Matt was taking symptomatic kids. That's a little different. Um, okay, so evolutionarily, the idea is how are we going to get through a dry season, right? And so one thought would be that Vivax, that lineage, they developed a hypnozoite. So they can sit in your liver and wait, wait it out until the mosquitoes come back. Falciparum, in our hands in, a, in the lab, and most people have done experimental work, doesn't go into a dormant state. And what the Australians are seeing in the spleens of these Indonesian folks are parasites in all, they're replicating in a normal phase. So it isn't that they've gone dormant, it's that they're actually replicating, but they're, they're stuck in this place. And the parasitemia stays very low because any parasite that escapes the spleen is then killed because it gets filtrated out in the filtration part of the spleen. So they would suggest there's no dormant phase, which I guess is good for drug development because they're metabolizing. Um, Dennis Kyle has proposed that falciparum can go into a dormant state. And I gather, you may know more about this than me, that that's not entirely well accepted. Um, we don't make, we don't see dormant parasites in our cultures, but if they're not replicating, they're hard to see. So I don't have a great answer for you on that. My bet would be that those parasites are replicating in a normal cycle in the, in the sequestered place, maybe the spleen or maybe the marrow or someplace else. And that basically exposure there. That's the thing, in terms of drugs. Yes, that's exactly so, right. So that's, so, exactly so that's what we should be. Yeah. Um, Chris, one more question. Oh, hi. Yeah, hi, Kirk. Um, just a comment on the dormant stage. I, uh, there was a, an old paper by Masamichi Aikawa. Um, I can't remember the, the um, year now. Um, what he did was to, for some reasons I can't remember, what he did was to take parasites and either exhaustively drug treat them over several cycles or exhaustively lies them with sorbitol over several cycles and keep culturing. And what he got back at the end were things that were either still drug sensitive or still sorbitol sensitive. We we repeated these experiments somewhat more uh, exhaustively. We never published it. But we certainly do see evidence of parasites that appear to be out of cycle hmm. for a given period of time. Okay. Maybe. Hmm. Hmm. Um, any further questions?
Yes. So it sounds like there's a bias towards certain R genes after they go through CSA. Do you know how they kind of come to one an agreement on one? <laughs> that is a spectacular question. So we first started addressing the question, how do they choose out of 60? That last set of data I had suggested that six or eight of them are preferentially activated. So that we felt like that was a big step forward. We went from 60 down to six. And I don't know how to get from six down to one. It's a really good question. One model out there would be that, let's imagine that these parasites that don't express any of our gene at all are sitting in this, wherever, in the spleen, in the marrow, wherever. <clears throat> they're not very fit. They don't replicate much. You can't see them because they're just sitting there. Um, if one of those parasites turns on a bar gene, that parasite now has a huge selective advantage because it can sequester. And that's what you see in that way, is that population that comes out. Then they get killed off and they go away. And then that, that small population of nulls is sitting there seeding these waves over time. And then you don't have to worry about switching from one bar gene to another. You're just switching from this null state into one. And that's why you always see almost homogeneous waves of parasite all the time. That would be an alternative hypothesis, but we, we have not figured out why one bar gene is better than another in terms of being preferentially activated. Um, yeah, we we have a couple of hunches, but nothing yet. Okay, last question. So uh, it's a big one, so I don't have a answer to that. How is the chromatin looking in uh, the managed parasite? The ones that have not had because we yeah. know canonically that you know the one at a time is special is that determined by the genetic marks you can handle. So, so we go back to we did cut and run to look at heterochromatin formation in the parasites. Okay. <clears throat> so what you'd find is that of course an active R gene is an open chromatin, and all these other guys are in silent chromatin, right? So if we go into the many state, it looks like all the VAR genes are more or less silent chromatin. So we see the H3K9 trimethylation mark across all of them. So that kind of makes sense. What we've become interested in is what is the chromatin that's forming here at this intron. I didn't tell you about this, but there's a, another promoter that sits here and it drives expression of a non-coding RNA. And we never knew what the function of that non-coding RNA was. And it was always presumed that this promoter is active in all of our genes in the whole of our gene family, making non-coding RNAs from all of them. And it was hard to distinguish if that wasn't true because this part of genes is highly conserved. So if you did a northern blot or anything, you'd just see everything. But now by sequencing really deeply, we can start to distinguish and we find out that this promoter is not active in all of our genes at the same time. And now our best hypothesis is those six or eight that are preferentially getting active, something is different about the chromatin structure here. So that's where we're going into looking at those families to find out if that's true. But I, don't, I can't tell you the answer because I don't have it. But that's our next our next thought. And and not that one, but this is quite obvious. It's like, uh, what happens with the uh, gametes that you consider that it doesn't make sense to hide in the screen if you will never transmit out and make the parasites <laughs> down the line. So that's a really good question that I don't have a very good answer for. So uh, my colleague at, at Cornell, Bjorn Kasek, works on sexual differentiation and gametocyte formation. And when we started manipulating SAM levels or doing things to, to force VAR gene expression, it was really annoying if the parasites started making gametocytes on us. So we intentionally used a line that couldn't make gametocytes, and we sort of ignored that whole thing. Uh, forgive me, we didn't do that. Um, so now we need to go back and relook at that. Uh, all of the things we're thinking about here and how does it influence gametocyte production in the many states? Do they make more gametocytes, less gametocytes? It doesn't matter at all, but we don't know. I think we'll leave it yeah. there. Thank you so much for a really wonderful talk. <laughs> and the next seminar on the 19th of April from Julia Pico. So please be there. Oh. Oh.